Hello, and welcome to LGBT, Past, Present, and Future. In this series, we will explore some of the struggles from our past, some accomplishments of our present, and look into the future. I'm your host, Robert E. Blackman. Today, I am honored to be joined by one of our tribe's elders. He is an LGBTQ rights activist, community organizer, and young in psychologist living in West Hollywood. He founded and co-founded multiple gay organizations, including the Radical Fairies and the LA Community Services Center, now known as Los Angeles LGBT Center, and the Van Ness Recovery House. Welcome, Don Kilhefner. Hi, Don, how are you? Greetings, Robert. <laughs> I'm, nice so, to be with I'm so excited, I'm, I'm tripping over myself. You are legendary, you are, you are royalty, so I, I wanna get into this. Um, my first question to you is, what do you think currently we as a community have learned from your early days of activism? Well, you know, it's important to remember that my early days of activism was radical gay liberation. Mm -hmm. And radical gay liberation doesn't exist anymore. Okay. What was once a movement has devolved into a political party, the democratic political party. And so the gay movement, a gay liberation movement no longer exists. Today we're largely characterized by gay assimilation and a gay sexual orientation model of gay identity. And uh, that's not what gay liberation was about. Okay. Um, I, as you well know, there are problems with pride today. There are serious problems with pride today. Do you in think 19... we understand them as a community? Do you, un do you think we understand what those problems are? You know, I come in contact with scores and scores of gay people, particularly gay men, every week from a wide range of uh, backgrounds, including lesbians. Mm -hmm. uh, Joe Tyese Williams is a close, longtime friend of mine. So I have a wide range of input into me. I think we have a LA gay community that is dissatisfied with the we hold pride and what has happened there. For example, in 1969, the 50th anniversary of Stonewall, uh, we hold pride made no mention whatsoever. It's as if the Stonewall Rebellion never happened. It's like it never existed. Pardon? It's like it never existed. Not like it never existed. Wow. Uh, this year, you're well aware of the trouble that was had with uh, all Black Lives Matter mm -hmm. when CSW, uh, Pride the Organization, flubbed that in many ways. Mm -hmm. Um, so, uh, Jewel Thais Williams and I have made a proposal to the gay community that the Gay Freedom Day celebration be moved to downtown Los, Los Angeles, mm -hmm. which represents more of the heart of Los Angeles, the and it be removed from WeHo. So, uh, um, that's one of the things that I think we're Today is very different than the beginnings in 1969 after Stonewall. Mm -hmm. I think. What's uh, your reaction to that? that that's, that's great. Uh, and that's a great segue to this next question because, um, as an, an elder of the community, I don't know if I like that word or not, but I, anyway, um, as. Well, why wouldn't you like it? Well, I, I, it, it, it almost suggests. I know that it tries to suggest um, respect, but um, just somebody who's been around, and I suppose you have to have a, I suppose you have to have a title for it, but um, I, I don't know. I, but well, I, let, let, me, let me just bounce off of that for a second. Yes, sure. Wherever our species is found throughout the world, cultural anthropologists tell us that our lives are divided into four sections. Okay. Youth, adulthood, elderhood, and ancestors. And that there is a profound interdependence 
between those age groups. And elders, one of the roles that elders play is the spiritual well-being of a community. So without elders, something is missing. Yeah. We need to honor ancestors. Yeah. We, it, a healthy community requires elders. Yes. The heavy lifting is done by adults. Yes. And it invites youth. I agree. So you as an elder are needed in your role as elder for a healthy gay and lesbian community. Everything that you said makes total sense. I think, I think what I was trying to articulate was that in our own sense of our community, there has always been a stigma and it attaches or it equates elder to old and uh, without use. Well, those are what I call olders. There are <laughs> elders and olders. Olders are people who have birthdays every year, watch a lot of television, have no sense of a role for themselves in the community. Fair enough. And sit Fair waiting enough. for death. Yes. Okay, so I got to get to the question. How, I, have how, how, I have a hunch you're an elder. Okay. How is an elder, um, do you help pass down what you've learned, especially sort of trying to go to uh, this new approach with downtown celebration? How do you pass that along to the youth without them reinventing the wheel? Well, first of all, you don't pass down. Okay. Uh, eldering uh, is a two-way street. Okay. Eldering has a coming out and coming in. Okay. And young people and adults feed me today in the way that I feed them as an elder. Oh, that's fantastic. So there's a profound interdependency going on there. I love that. I love that. That is awesome. That is awesome. And I think that's one of those things that, that I think we as a community lack or miss or forget you know that we do need each other we do mm -hmm. need we need the energy and as you said the, the heavy lifting of the of the younger generations but we also need the adults 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 of the yeah, yeah, adults yeah. of the adults, Not youth, adults, yes, the adults yes but we also need the knowledge and experience from our elders i, I yes. love that um no, go ahead do you think that equality is actually possible? And if so, what does that look like to you? Um, it isn't, the question isn't equality okay. as much as it is, what are gay people doing that we have kept reappearing century, century, millennium after millennium. And we know from evolutionary biology that a trait is not passed on from one generation to the next generation unless that trait is contributing to the evolution of our species. So the question is not equality. Uh, the question is, what are we doing? Why are we here? What is our contribution to And society? what do you think that is? Um, I... Uh, let, let me just say, scientists have said, E.O. Wilson, uh, one of the most prominent scientists in the United States today, says, quote, homosexuals may be the rare carriers of the altruistic impulse in the human species, unquote. Now he's saying, we carry something around um, uh, 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 idealism, and that we contribute that to society. Uh, Joan Rothgarden, an evolutionary biologist at Stanford, says we carry the cooperative principle in uh, the human species. So what I would say, enlarging that, I would say we carry something around a spiritual principle in the widest possible definition of spiritual. I'm not talking about religion. I'm talking about a spiritual principle that we are contributing to society. So heterosexuals and homosexuals, it's not about equality. It is about um, not being oppressed. Okay. But uh, it's more like yin and yang in the Asian system that we complement and supplement each other mm. in very profound ways. So I'm not against equality, obviously. Mm -hmm. 
I thought about that. I've studied that. Um, I've been very careful about that. But there's a larger question that be we need to be asking ourselves. Right. And in all truth, Robert, I think the current generation has kind of petered out. And I'm looking to a younger generation, the next generation of gay liberation, queer liberation, to be asking those kinds of questions. Mm. It'll sort of come I see you. Um, yes. Um, so we only have a, a few minutes left, but I, I would, I would like to know um, sort of your final thoughts. What, uh, as they would say in program, a burning desire that you have to share. What should we know? Well, I, I don't know about knowing, but I suggest uh, um, um, that we remove the um, uh, Gay Freedom Day celebration from West Hollywood uh, to Los Angeles. Los Angeles is 70% non-Caucasian. West Hollywood is 18% non-Caucasian. It's a white city, extremely wealthy, doesn't really represent uh, the gay community in all of its features. Downtown LA would be a place where south meets north, east meets west, and we can all come together in the colors of the rainbow. West Hollywood only has one color, right? I love that. I absolutely love that. And <laughs> my younger 19-year-old uh, self who moved to, uh, to West Hollywood, from the Midwest, uh, if that were today and that were downtown, I think that I would probably be a different person now. Amen. So, Robert, I love you. I love you too. Thank you. Thank You're you. You're welcome. So much. I wish. I wish we had more time. Thank you so much. Uh, call time. me up anytime when we can talk. I love that. I love that. Um, Thank you so much today for uh, Don Phil Hefner and his advice and his words of wisdom. As always here, we hope to enlighten, to educate, and to create positive conversation. Today, with its 800,000 members, Equality California is the nation's largest statewide LGBTQ plus civil rights organization. And in California, it is the only LGBTQ plus civil rights organization working at the local, state, and national levels. Today, I am honored to have the organization's executive director, Rick Chavez Zaber. Did I say that correctly? Yes, you did. Oh. You, get, you, get a, you get a medal. So. <laughs> well, people get my name wrong all the time, so I try to, try to make sure that I, I do my best uh, getting people's names right. How are you today? I'm good. I'm good. It's a beautiful day in Los Angeles, and uh, obviously we're in Pride Month. And, yes. Yes. Um, I, I'm. I'm feeling very. I'm feeling very proud here. I've got my all temperature queer shirt on here. I'm. I'm feeling happy and proud, and um, and and just just very honored to to have you talk about what you you guys do and how you help the community. Um, the first thing I'd like to, to ask you, uh, among the many things that you guys do as an organization, uh, you help fight for the civil rights uh, and social justice for our community. And now more than ever, that is important with the Black Lives, Mo Black Lives Matter movement and so forth. Um, how has that shaped uh, specifically the movement, how has that shaped what you guys already do? Well, so we Bachi, you know, have always considered ourselves a civil rights and social justice organization. Mm -hmm. um, and that was really grounded in the fact that, you know, once we actually had broad civil rights protections in California for LGBTQ plus people, we, we asked ourselves, what is it that we need to do to really achieve lived equality? Um, you know, we might have equality in the law, but how do we achieve equality in people's lives? And I love that lived equality. I, I like that, yeah. So, you know, one of the things we know is if you measure, you know, if you look at metrics, and we're very metrics driven as an organization, if you look at sort of measures of health and well being, um, you know, how, how, whether someone is actually equal in living in their lives, everything from homelessness, we're four out of 10 homeless youth, and it looks like that number for adults are LGBTQ. Plus, 
high rates of dropouts in school, um, high rates of interaction with the police and the criminal justice system, low rates of health insurance coverage, high rates of smoking, high rates of substance use, um, you know, really um, uh, low, low economic status, high rates of poverty. Um, we know that LGBTQ people fare poorly on those measures, but if you're also an LGBTQ person who has another identity that is actually subject to lack of acceptance and discrimination, you're an LGBTQ person of color, or you're an immigrant, or you're a person living with HIV, um, or you're transgender, which is not dual, right? But um, uh, that you're really at the bottom of every measure. So really, that has always guided our programs at Equality California. And so, um, you know, we've always looked at our work from an intersectional lens, knowing that you know our mission is to bring the voices of LGBTQ plus people and our allies to institutions of power with the goal of creating a world that's healthy, just, and fully equal for all, and all is the key word, all LGBTQ plus people. And in order to do that, we actually have to focus on issues of immigrant rights and racial justice and criminal justice reform. Um, and so that's always been embedded in our program. Right. But you know, the events of the last four, four or five weeks now um, have really caused us to continue to elevate that and see how we can center um, the anti-racism movement and the Black Lives Matter movement um, even more forcefully and strongly in our programming. Have these movements, um, like even the the other week, which was just so amazing, sort of all Black Lives Matter with that movement and everything? How? And I still get chills because you know the fact that we are thinking about our our trans community for a change is is I hate to use the word refreshing, but you know there's always somebody sort of left out over to the side and it just yep. feels like everybody for, for the first time in in my existence it feels like everybody is at least um visible and has the opportunity to have a voice has this movement or series of movements helped uh the organization or hindered them, or what has that been like? I mean, because this is what you do day in and day out, and now you've got like a spotlight. How, has that helped at all? Um, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, one of the things that we want to do is we really actually want to center our allyship. And, you know, we're not only allies, obviously, we have Black people on our staff and in our membership as well. Um, but we're both allies in some sense, and we are part of the movement in another. And we think that it's important to really center the leadership of this movement in the Black community, Black people, Black LGBTQ people. And so we, um, you know, one of the things that we've done is it's given us some opportunities, though, to do some things that I think, um, um, you know, are important in educating the broader community, and we have a very broad membership about why um, the LGBTQ civil rights movement and the Black Lives Matter movement and the, and the movement for immigrant rights um, and, you know, essentially equality for everyone, how they're, you know, they're, they're different in ways, um, but they're very intertwined. And obviously, if we're going to achieve a world the kind of world that I think we all want to live in as um, LGBTQ people, people of color, um, immigrants, um, we have to be in allyship and in strong allyship with each other. And all of these movements are related and intertwined. And I think that's allowed us to continue to advance that message and, and educate, um, educate the broader community. Obviously, there's many people in our community that really understand this already, but there's some people that, that, that don't as much. You've mentioned this a couple of times, and I, I don't want this uh, point to get lost because I think it's very important. You've mentioned um, the allies and partnerships with, uh, you know, with other communities and, and so forth within this outside of us. Um, we know what our battles and struggles are because they've always been. How do our community partners and leaders, um, straight people and other various people who may not have this fight be their own how how do they how how do we involve them how do they participate in a meaningful way you know i think we um some of this is about 
educating um, ourselves and um, and educating how we can actually not lose the political force of this moment, right? And so, I mean, what do you mean have, by that? I think we have an opportunity to have, you know, we we've seen police killings of black people, transgender people, transgender women of color, um, you know, white gay men out in Wyoming, um, you know, for many years. Um, I do though think that, you know, the, the issue of institutional racism is one that, um, you know, we've seen these, um, the way that police have treated black people for years and there've been short, you know, short periods of protests that have resulted in, at best, you know, minor changes or no changes at all. As soon as the as soon as the latest event sort of fades from yeah. public view, mm -hmm. I think just the um, really the the heartbreaking tragedies of these most recent killings and the fact that um, the community has been you know, so um, impacted and said, you know, it's time, this is enough, we have to do something about this. Um, and the extent and the extent of the expression of that frustration, um, I think does give us an opportunity to make some changes from a, from a, um, from a government perspective. Mm -hmm. um, and at the same time also gives us some, uh, an ability to, really change hearts and minds. You know, our community has always been about changing hearts and minds. And, um, um, and I think, you know, um, you know, there are issues of implicit bias that everyone has in some way in their life. And I think sort of the, the ability to educate people to have conversations, sometimes that are not going to be comfortable. Right. People examine They're themselves. Be pretty, yeah. Yeah. And I'm, you know, I'm not immune from that. I need to, uh, you know, I need to be thinking about, I'm a, I come, I have a lived experience as, uh, you know, half Latino, half Czech gay man that mm -hmm. grew up in a farm community and I look at the world in a certain way. Right. Um, and, um, and I don't have the same experience that um, a black gay man has or a, a Latina transgender woman has. Right. And so all of those things are things that, I, and I think we all, those of us who are, uh, you know, progressives and, of good faith and really care about other people. Mm -hmm. I think we, you know, we all want to do the right thing, but right. we also, I think all need to be educated about how, um, about, about issues of implicit bias and how we can be better allies to, to, to the black community in particular in this time, um, and in, in really doing the things that are required to end institutional racism. Right. We need to change institutions. Um, you know, one of the things that's on our mission is that we bring the voices of LGBTQ people to institutions of power. Mm. One of the theories of our, of our organization and one of the things we focus on is institutional change. Okay. That's why we have programs in the schools, you know, to try to basically help teachers and administrators. Starting um, from the inside. Right. Well, yeah. you know, support LGBTQ kids to sort of prevent suicides in the exactly. schools and exactly. to prevent drop. You know, uh, another set of institutions is our criminal justice systems and law enforcement. And we haven't done as much as we should on that. But, you know, uh, addressing these issues is in part changing the way people changing. think about yeah. and how police think about it. us rethinking right. what is the role of police. Should police be the frontline folks for certain kinds of problems? Right. Um, you know, what is the education that the police have and the mentality of a police force? I mean, we know there's a problem because this is so endemic throughout the country. Endemic, and some police absolutely, absolutely. Some police departments are doing it better. Other police departments are not doing it well at all. And even some of the better ones, we know um, that there's big problems. So right. um, that brings me to, um, uh, that's a great segue to this next question. Um, what do you see our biggest challenges that face us immediately, like our immediate challenge challenges going forward with with this, it, with the with the anti racism movement. Yes, and and you were talking about with the policing and 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 um, you know certain certain uh, 
people or organizations may not be uh, the best fit. So uh, what are our challenges in making um, those revisions? You know, I think the biggest challenge is, is sort of keeping the focus on this. Um, you know, there's legislation that's moving through the Congress, obviously, um, one, uh, you know, what's coming out of the House is better and more robust than what's coming out of the Senate, which as you might expect is actually um, feels like a bit of a fig leaf, right? It's something to try to make this go away. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's really keeping the political pressure on and making sure that, you know, those, um, you know, I think there's a lot of um, um, organizations that um, are not led by uh, led within the black community mm -hmm. that I think can, um, that really want to um, be supportive of the leadership in the black community. And I think it's sort of keeping that momentum there, keeping those coalitions together um, and continuing to push so that we've got change at the federal level, we're actually doing things at the state. Um, in California now, for example, we just supported a group, I think of 16 or 18 bills that are priorities of the California Legislative Black Caucus wow. that do everything from banning chokeholds to banning rubber bullets, probation reform. Um, we were active in advocating for uh, uh, something called ACA5, which is a provision that would actually put back on the ballot in California um, the repeal of Prop 209, which um, was passed in the 1990s and basically prohibits California universities and other institutions from actually implementing affirmative action programs. So mm. that did pass the um, the the, um, the assembly last week. But so we're actually um, we've always done some of these kinds of bills, but we're really focusing on okay, are there how can we work in allyship and bring the LGBT the voice of the LGBTQ community into mix to support the leadership of the of the Legislative Black Caucus in California. So we're going to be putting a lot of muscle behind a yeah. lot of these. We've actually been calling a lot of the swing legislators that we have good relationships with and advocating for these bills. Um, but I, th I think the biggest challenge is keeping the momentum going. You know, the yeah. change is not something that's yeah. going to happen. Hopefully there will be changes that happen quickly. Um, but this is, you know, a quick change will probably take a year or two, right? Well, it's a work in progress for sure. <laughs> So I do don't we want to, we're, we're almost out of time, but I don't want uh, this to go by without um, you letting people who may not be as familiar with the organization, who may still want to help, but they don't know how to or, or where to go. Um, how can people uh, reach out to you guys? And um, um, I'm sure that you, you don't turn down help. No, no, we, and we always need help. And um, Obviously, uh, we can, you can go to our website, which is www.eqca.org. Um, and there's uh, information about our programs, how to plug in, how to participate in the census, how to register to vote, and also how to vote. contribute. To vote. Vote. And the one last thing I do want to say is yes. that we've actually, um, we just launched recently a COVID-19 helpline in the state. Oh, fantastic. Um, so it's statewide, basically. Um, we have a website that provides help for, we know that LGBTQ people have been hit uh, by this um, pandemic um, to greater than the general public. Mm -hmm. um, the, you know, we have the higher comorbidities mm -hmm. um, than the general public. So, you know, high rates of immune suppression, high rates of smoking, um, high rates of certain kinds of cancer, high rates of homelessness, all of those lead to the fact that there's, um, that we believe LGBTQ people uh, uh, have um, are greater health effects and greater right. fatality. Right. And then on the economic side, we work in the gig economy, the retail and hospitality sectors. Right. About 20% of the general public and it's about 40% of the LGBTQ community. So we have a lot of our folks facing unemployment. So this is intended to really try to help provide and connect them to services. It's an online website that has services by county in the state of California and a um, and a helpline, and we're doing the same thing with our affiliate, uh, Silver State Equality in Nevada. Fantastic. Now, is that all on your website as well? It is. There's, there is, uh, there's links to that in our website. Fantastic. But there's a whole separate COVID-19 uh, helpline website that you can access through our website. Fantastic. Wow. The time has flown, but thank you so much. The, 
we have to do this again because I'm sure that there's a whole lot of other information that we didn't cover and you, you, you are just very enlightening and you're, you're shedding a lot of very important information and your organization is doing great work. We really, really appreciate it. Thank you so much for spending the time with us. Um, and as Rick said, if you are interested in finding out more about the organization, please go to their website. Rick Zaver, did I get it right again? You did. Get two medals. Thank you. <laughs> happy, happy Pride Month. Thank you so much, Rick, for joining us. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much. With my final guest in this series, we look to our future and what it has in store. I am joined by someone who is helping to navigate that path forward. He is on the Lesbian and Gay Advisory Board and member and former co-chair of the City of West Hollywood. Please welcome Duke Mason. Duke, welcome. Thank you so much for taking the time to be with us. How are you today? I'm good. I'm thrilled to be here with you. Thank you so much. Let's just dive right into it. So the future almost feels like it's in the present with the recent Supreme Court ruling uh, that gay and transgendered workers are protected by federal law forbidding the uh, discrimination uh, in the workplace. What does that mean for our community? I think there's two really important things to remember. I mean, of course, it's important that we celebrate and we recognize what an important um, decision this was. Mm -hmm. But number one, there's still a lot of work to do. We still need to pass the Equality Act um, in this Congress because obviously there's lots of things, including um, housing, health care. There are a lot of areas where um, the LGBTQ community are still not um, uh, covered in terms of protections. Mm -hmm. um, also, I think it's really important for us to remember that we would not be receiving these protections now if it were not for the work that was done 55, 60 years ago by, the, um, by those who were leading the fight for uh, civil rights for the African-American community. Right. It's kind of mind blowing actually when you think about it in the sense that you know, Martin Luther King, Bayard Rustin, all the people that fought all those years ago, we are now directly benefiting from their work. And it's kind of, when you think about it in that context, it kind of makes you realize how important, you know, sometimes we don't see in the short term how these actions are going to impact people right. in the future. Um, but that's because why you we, always have we to... ourselves may not see them. Exactly. Exactly. So it's, it's all about thinking long term. And I, I think um, it's important for us to recognize and remember that. That's a great uh, that's a great point. And that actually sort of segues into this next question. Um, how does our our future generation harness all of that energy and that passion and these victories that we are currently seeing, how do they harness that uh, into going forward and, and making it better? Well, one thing that I, I personally feel very strongly about, and I know a lot of people think, you know, and, and look, it's, there's truth to the fact that because of gerrymandering, because of voter suppression, of course, there are issues when it comes to big issues, when it comes to voting and, and, and the access to, to voting. However, I think that the most important thing we can do um, in the aftermath of all the protests we've seen and, and all some of these Supreme Court victories is we have to vote and we all have to vote. Amen. Can you say it one more time? We have to vote. <laughs> vote. Yes. No, because I mean, a lot of people think, oh, well, you know, voting doesn't matter. But if every single person that vote that uh, participated in these protests um, votes in this next election, there's no way that we're going to lose. I just think Absolutely. a lot of time people think, you know, vote, you know, uh, the system's broken, which it is to some extent. But people think, oh, I'm not going to participate or voting doesn't matter or doesn't make a difference. Right. I think we've seen that and you know through obviously the 2000 election 2016 that um elections have consequences and so do. i just really hope that every young person out there even if they feel uh, you know disillusioned and cynical about the system just please just go out there and vote for for joe biden i promise you that um that uh, it will make a difference and, and and things will get better i always say to people just in general um mm -hmm. Voting is personal, right? And it's none of my business who you vote for, 
But I always feel like if you don't vote, you don't have a right to bitch because you were not participatory in the process. And yep. I think to your point, yes, our system is broken, but we broke it. Like right. we, we allowed these systems to be implemented. We allowed whether we sat on our hands and did not vote or whether we, well, I voted. Yeah, but did, did you get your friends out to vote? Did you yeah. go and scour your neighborhood to make sure that everybody had a ride to vote? You know what I mean? So we play uh, a definite immediate role in the process for sure. And as I watched the uh, fundraiser that President Obama did with uh, Joe Biden the other night, and he said, you know, and he said it before that voting is not voting and protesting are not mutually exclusive. Right. And and, you know, I think I think that's important for people to remember that, of course, the system's broken and of course, there are things that need to change. But um, the only way that we're going to actually put and enshrine real change into law is by voting and protesting is important to build the momentum so that we can then implement those uh, changes sure. uh, and enshrine them in, in legislation. You know? Absolutely. Um, so I want to switch gears just a little bit because our current climate is very intense. You know, everybody's on eggshells for a whole lot of reasons. But um, I think with the, I hate to say it, but with the epiphany that uh, black and brown people are not equal in the eyes of the law, even though in the law, it says we are. Um, mm -hmm. I find that it's very interesting that the passion that is being driven is mostly by our youth. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell me uh, what you feel um, young people see differently as it relates to race relations? Uh, because it doesn't seem to be as big of a deal or mm -hmm. as much as a stigma to uh, our younger generation. Can you explain that a little bit to our audience? I think there's a realization, and it's uh, especially in the last three or four years since Trump uh, became president, that that all of the various social justice movements, of course, there there are big differences, and you know, and and you shouldn't equate uh, each respective movement. However, there there are a lot of things that we have in common as LGBTQ people, as African Americans, as women as uh, you know brands as brand yeah. absolutely so i think there's a realization that more and more people are sort of uh coming to that if unless we support each other and our unique um you know uh movements for 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 justice we're not none of us are going to succeed and um and i think that one reason we've seen so much progress in the last three or four years and you know in fighting trump and succeeding at preventing some of the worst uh things that he's tried to do is because we've supported each other and so you know when you've seen all these uh young people out there including myself you know i was out there uh protesting um it's because we realize that the movement for racial justice is intrinsically tied together with that of every other major social justice movement. And so I think that's the big ch the difference that people are realizing, you know, I can't just go out there for my own, you know, uh, specific benefit. Mm -hmm. um, we have to stand up for each other. And, um, and I think that's one big reason why we've been successful that Harvey Milk, even though, you know, he was more than 40 years ago now yeah. when he said this, yeah. he used to talk about the us's that it's not about blacks or gays or women or Latinos. It's about the us's right. and that if we come together and support each other, there's no way that we, that we can lose. And I think that is proving to be true. I agree. I, uh, I, this makes me think of, um, Recently, there was the series of uh, all Black Lives Matters uh, marches around the country. And I, I get goosebumps just now thinking about it because um, someone had said in a post somewhere online about, you know, it's very interesting that uh, as Black and Brown people, you now want us to march with you, but where were you when we needed you to march for us? And I, I, I couldn't believe that I was actually seeing everybody 
You know, it was like Neapolitan ice cream or Benetton. Everybody was out straight and gay and trans and, and uh, senior citizens and everybody because we truly are in a place and time where unless we are including everybody, we're discriminating. And that, that goes for, I think, our own community as well. So I, I just, that just made me proud to see. Um, another thing President Obama said in, in the, at the fundraiser the other day was things are different now because unlike 50 or 60 years ago, I mean, yes, there were white people participating in, in the freedom marches, mm -hmm. but it was mostly African-American people. Right. Right. Um, that's no longer the case that, you know, there are, you know, maybe I don't know about just as many, but certainly way more white people there are a lot. protesting and participating there now are, than ever before. There are a lot. Because we finally recognize, we finally recognize that, you know, it's not about one group versus another. It's about all of us supporting each other um, and make, trying to make this country more equitable for, for everyone. You know? Absolutely. I, I completely agree. I completely agree with that. Um, it's funny that you mentioned that. So when I'm watching on television and there are all these marches and I'm looking, I'm like, there are a whole lot of white people out here. And I don't know actually how I felt about that, honestly. At the beginning, I was, because again, my very lovely, lovely um, white friends and family members would mm -hmm. call me and text me and instant message me, like almost as to say, I'm sorry, but I'm like, you didn't do anything wrong. But I realized that collectively on both sides of this coin, we all are learning and educating together. Like I had to realize, oh, they're not doing this just because they feel like they have to do something. Right. They're doing this because they have to do something, yeah. you know? And yeah. it, was, it, it was definitely an eye opener for me as well. So um, I, mm -hmm. I'm enjoying the process and learning from the experience as well. Okay, we've got one last question and I always love these questions. Um, you're actually my last question for all of this series, which I've so enjoyed. An honor. What Thanks. do you think our future looks like? What is your hope for our future? I mean, I know I've sort of already made this point, so it may seem a little redundant, but okay. you know, I really think the most important thing we can do, not just in this next election, but going forward, hopefully, God willing, um, when we have a new president, is to support each other. There's no more gay rights movement or you know, uh, African-American civil rights movement or women's movement. It's all part of a collective movement. And um, I don't think that was the case before Trump. I really think mm. that um, you know, it used to be that everybody was sort of divided in their own respective um, causes. Mm -hmm. But I think now we realize that this is part of one big progressive movement. And the only way that we're going to be able to create change and progress moving forward, the only way we're going to get President, God willing, President Joe Biden to actually implement the progressive uh, agenda that we want him to is by pushing together to advance that uh, those causes as one big cause. So um, my hope for the future is that we embrace that idea and that that philosophy and sort of that that um, way of, of doing things. And I think if we do that, um, the next few years can be are going to be really exciting and really transformative, hopefully for this country. They are definitely going to be interesting. And um, I don't know if we will see that change in my lifetime or your lifetime maybe your lifetime but i think at least the generation after us hopefully they will be able to reap the benefits um of what we are doing now i so enjoyed this duke thank you so much for taking the time to uh share your thoughts and your experiences on what our future Holds for us. Thank you so much. Thank you, Robert. Thank you. This concludes day one of programs in the Our Pride two day event. Our purpose is to enlighten, educate, and create positive change not only in our LGBTQ community, but with everyone. Thanks to my guests, Don Kiel Hefner, Rick Chavez Zabur, 
and Duke Mason. They represent our past, present, and future, and continue to lead by example. It is my personal hope that from these three interviews, you take the knowledge from our past, use it to participate in our present, and invest in our future generations to come. Please tune in tomorrow as Ben Kowaler kicks off day two with some of the community's most colorful queer people as they use their voices to create change and celebrate the month of pride. I don't want to name drop, but Margaret Cho, Jay Rodriguez, Ms. Mayhem Hill, and Haunted Davenport, just to name a few. Thanks to Here TV and The Fight Magazine, and of course, you. None of this would be possible without you. Thank you so much. Have a great night and a happy Pride Month.